So well said uh, about what I, what I personally feel is one of the greatest presidents we've had. But anybody else take another guy like Ronald Reagan again? And uh, just as we remember today the uh, meaning of Memorial Day, of this weekend and all that it represents, I want to challenge you again uh, to not let what was done, not let what the, the men and women who gave their lives for us, don't let that sacrifice uh, only be something that we, you know, have cookouts for and, and have just a time, you know, a short time each year that we kind of think about it. Uh, I'm really thankful to be living in this country. Anybody with me? And I don't ever want to take for granted the sacrifices that were made uh, to get us here. I think it's so appropriate, this series that we've been walking through. Uh, I honestly didn't uh, plan it this way when, when we were uh, planning the year out, but I think it appropriate that today's message falls on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, there, there's a lot of emotions that go in uh, to this time. There's a lot of things that it represents. And the topic of the Holy Spirit, uh, that was the gift that Jesus said that it was good that he would go to heaven. After Christ gave his life for us, he said, I'm, I'm going because there's somebody that's going to be good for you, a comforter, a friend. It, it's good that I go away so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. He, he died, he did his job, he took care of business on the cross. And then even beyond that, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, those people that gave their lives for our country, they left behind some great things, great freedoms that we all enjoy. And there's freedom in the Holy Spirit as well. Can anybody say amen? And so even though uh, this weekend, it, it, like I said earlier, it's somber. It's very sobering to think about uh, that uh, people would give their lives, many of them on foreign soil, away from their families, in, in the horrors of war. Uh, I, I'm very emotional when I really think about all that this time represents. Uh, I'm even a little emotional this week as I look out. We, we remember uh, Corky and Bubba are going to be moving here real soon. And, and we're going to have to have a memorial weekend just for the BBs, I think, uh, someday. We're going to miss you guys. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, with all that, that's happening that's sobering, that's somber, it's also a time of celebration. And not just because Clinton's birthday was yesterday and he turned 50 years old, but... Uh, because of, because of what they left behind. I just wanted to tell everybody he was 50. But because of what, yeah, you can clap for him. That's awkward. One person. Happy birthday, brother. But as, as we talk today about the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, again, we've tried our best to uh, be honest with you. I've tried to, to hopefully dispel some of the confusion and myths surrounding God who is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we talked about the, the actual uh, words, Holy Spirit. Every time it's mentioned in the Bible, if it's the Old Testament, it's that word ruach, which uh, means breath or wind. And, and in the New Testament, it's a word that means similar. It's pneuma. Uh, and, and we don't really have a perfect word in English, so they kind of tried to use the words uh, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, uh, because you know holy wind or holy breath just didn't really have the same ring to it, I suppose, but uh, while God is a spirit, the Holy Spirit represents that just uh, burst of energy, that burst of inspiration that you can only get through God. And can I challenge you this morning, if you find yourself in a place in life, a place in your relationship with God where you just kind of feel, you know, uh, stuck, we talked about how there's a place that it's called the doldrums, a literal place. People will say, I'm in the doldrums, or I'm blue, or I'm depressed. There's an actual place that sailors refer to as the doldrums where there's no breeze. The way the trade winds meet, uh, it, it's kind of a, just a, a place where ships would go back when they had only sailing vessels. And if they got stuck in the doldrums, they would usually die because there was no wind to, to get them out of there. And, and when, when we're thinking about that spiritually, if you're in a place that you just feel spiritually dead, you need to better know and better understand the person who is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not a thing. He is God, just like God the Father, just like God the Son. Amen. So today, we're going to try to walk through and unpackage what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. How many of you in here have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? 
lot of us. And I know many of us come from uh, maybe Pentecostal backgrounds or charismatic, the, the charismatic circles or whatever. We're familiar with it. But those that aren't, sometimes it's got packaged in a way that it's a little bit confusing, maybe even frightening. And, and that's not the Holy Ghost's fault. That, that's one reason I don't like calling it the Holy Ghost, because ghosts are scary. God is not scary. Uh, not, not to those who are his children. He's only frightening if you're on the other side. Okay? But, but when we are his children, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is our comforter, our friend. And I want you to understand that as we talk about three baptisms that are found in Scripture this morning, I want to just uh, read again from Acts 19, verses 1 and 2, where it says, Apollos was at Corinth, but Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is the Holy Spirit. Now, as we talk about this country that we live in, I remember, if any of you remember uh, the uh, lady, she's a minister, she's been a missionary, uh, Anoush Bullock. Did any of y'all remember her coming and speaking to us? She grew up in the Soviet Union, and, and, in you know, what is now Russia, and she talked about when she first came to America, you know, the, all the things that we have, the blessings. She'd never been here. She didn't know a place like this even existed, and she said they would pray and fast for eggs, sometimes just one egg because they needed it to complete you know, a meal. or they, they, they didn't have clean water. They would have to fill their bathtubs certain times of the month in hopes of saving enough clean water to use later on in the weeks uh, ahead. And it just the things that we take for granted, she was amazed to go in grocery stores and see that we had diet cat food. And, and when you think about these things that, that we are so blessed with, there's other people in the world that y'all... They haven't even heard that there's a country that compares with the United States. They're not even aware that there's such blessings and such great things that God has given us. So as we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, anyone who has not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I don't think you're less of a Christian. You're not less saved or less loved by God. You may just have never heard. And it's my hope today to present it to you in a way that is scriptural, that is, that, is in, that is balanced with the word of God so you can receive the fullness of God in your life. I want you to pray that way with me before we get into today's message. Would you pray that God would help us to be ready to receive all that he wants us to receive. Father, I look to you to give direction. Holy Spirit, I just pray for you to have your way this morning, for your word to go forth, God, and us to receive it and be changed by it. In the name of Jesus, I pray, and all in agreement said, so let's, let's talk about these three baptisms. In this first one, you may not have thought of it as a baptism. The first baptism, that, I, if you're uh, keeping notes, and I hope you do, if, if you're a guest, uh, we provide you with uh, little three-ring binders if you'd like to keep these uh, note sheets that are in your worship guides so that you can take them with you and even collect them if you want to look back on things that maybe God has spoken to you. This first baptism is simply being baptized into the body of Christ. Number one is being baptized into the body of Christ. And understand, uh, it's not in your notes, but you may want to jot it out to the side. This is simply what we call salvation many times. But I want to un unpackage a little bit of it because a lot of people have a limited understanding, I think, of what it means to be saved. They think salvation is just like a, a quick decision you make or a, a repeat after me prayer you pray or maybe you fill out a little card like we have connection cards. We want to know if you've made a decision for Christ. But all those things, uh, they're, they're just external uh, evidences of something that happens internally. When you are saved, you are what's called baptized into the body of Christ. And again, this isn't in your notes, but I'd, I'd encourage you maybe to write this down uh, so that you'd remember it. The biblical definition of baptism really doesn't matter if there's water involved or not. To be baptized literally just means to be immersed. That's the key word, immersed. To be immersed in something. So when you're baptized into Jesus, when you're baptized into the body of Christ, or into salvation, you become immersed in Christ. Let's look at some scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, that body being the body of Christ. That's what we call the family of God, or the church, if you will, is the body 
of Christ. And notice very, it's very important to realize we're all baptized by one spirit. That's that word pneuma, which is the Holy Spirit. We're baptized by the Holy Spirit into salvation, into the body of Christ. So when, when you think about the Holy Spirit, I hope it's not weird to you or scary to you because the Holy Spirit's the one that baptizes us into salvation. So if you understand salvation, you should have a, an understanding of the Holy Spirit. Galatians three twenty six and 27 tells us this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, Look at this, have clothed yourselves with Christ. Can I tell you, church, we don't need to just try to get people to come to church. Or even, and please don't be offended by what I'm about to say, I don't mean it in a bad way. We're not even just trying to get people to come to the altar. Can somebody say amen? Do you know how many altar calls Jesus gave? Do you know how many were even mentioned in the New Testament? It's actually a practice we picked up from the Catholic Church, which it's not a bad practice. I got saved in an altar call. Who's with me? Altar calls can be awesome. They can be powerful. But you know what? The altar call is not God. That's not what we're coming to. You're not just coming to a preacher or a church or a denomination. We are being baptized into the body of Christ. And that means to be immersed in Christ. When you give your life to the Lord, that immersion is what I want you to remember. Because many people, I don't know that they really wanted to be saved as much as they didn't want to go to hell. Anybody honest in here this morning? I felt that way when I was young. Somebody got up and preached on hell, uh, and, and it was a, my dad had this evangelist. Boy, he talked about the horrors of hell. And y'all, I just was fidgety in my seat the whole time, and I was thinking, I hope the Lord doesn't come back before he gives the altar call, because I want to hurry up and go get saved. I'd already been saved like seven times during that revival and you may can relate to that if you've grown up in a church background like me where it's like man I'm just so scared of of this and 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 yes we need to have a reverence don't nobody want to go to hell I understand but more than that more than we should be afraid of going to hell we should want to come to Jesus if if hell wasn't even a factor Jesus has done so much for us he deserves our love not just are trying to take advantage of a free trip to heaven. And so when you give your life, you are baptized into the body of Christ. The second baptism you may be more familiar with is what we call water baptism. Uh, here at Lakeview, every third Sunday, we offer being baptized in water. And now I want to explain the difference because some, some denominations actually teach that you have to be water baptized to be saved. And again, we're trying to cut through all the denominational stuff and just look to the Word of God. I, 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 the Bible does a better job of explaining things to me. We're part of a Pentecostal denomination called the Church of God. We would be the first to admit to you, we don't have all the answers. Can somebody say amen? Denominations are not the answer. God is the answer. We want to look to God. We want to look to God's Word. Denominations are just hum humans' best shot at trying to explain things that we really need to just trust God for. And what happened so long ago uh, in the early church was when denominations started to being formed, I was talking about this with someone this morning, a kind of fascinating and frustrating thing happened. Y'all, first when people got you know, saved and filled with the Holy Ghost at the beginning of, of the book of Acts and the first church went out, in a relatively small time, millions of people became Christians across the world. It just spread over the course of just a generation or two. The likes of which we've never seen. That, that revival that swept the world. It was incredible. But you know what we'll sometimes do as Christians after we have a great victory? We just get stuck in our celebration. And it was almost like they thought, well, so much good has been done. Now we've got to figure out what to do with all these new people. And we're going to get them in church and get them, you know, we, we, we want to disciple them. It was good intention. But you know what started happening is people got involved more than God. And we started saying, well, who do you get to lead? And who do I get to be the leader of? And we started giving people titles like clergy. We talked about that last week. And laity. And we started labeling all these things. And, and we sort of watered down the power and the, and the beauty of these, these things of being baptized in the body and of water baptism. Let me explain a, a difference. It has nothing to do with denominations. It's just what the Word of God says. Water baptism doesn't save you. 
But it is very, very important. In fact, there's, I think, like 20-something, about 27 instances in Scripture where it talks about someone getting saved and then they are told to be water baptized. Jesus himself was water baptized. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Amen. So you may, that may be the step you're at. You've, you've been baptized into salvation, but you've never been water baptized. Let me tell you why it's important. Salvation is a personal, private gift. And you may notice uh, many times when we offer for you to be saved, it's, it's just there at your seat. You can signify it, raising your hand or just uh, talking to God yourself. Because, y'all, I can't do it for you. Nobody can do it for you. It's between you and the Lord. And honestly, walking in an aisle, many uh, traditions in church, we, we, we had the tradition where you would walk to the front and the pastor would pray for you. You'd fill out a little piece of paper. They would take you to a prayer room. All good. Like I said, I got saved at an altar call. But some people, we, we've limited to that. They think that's the only way you get saved or the only time you can be saved. Aren't y'all thankful that there's more opportunity to know God than just in a little 30-minute window on a weekend? Or maybe a Wednesday night if you're super faithful. And so th- these things, this baptism in water, it's significant because, again, salvation is personal. It's private. It's between you and God. But it says that relationship with God is not supposed to stay private. You're not supposed to be a closet Christian. And it's a ceremony. Just like we have a, a wedding ceremony, the ceremony itself doesn't really marry you. You've got to make a decision that you're going to be committed to that person. And when you make that decision, that commitment... And, and you join your souls together, you join your hearts together. That's really what marriage is, isn't it? It's not just because uh, a lady wore a white dress and some people threw rice at you. Are you even allowed to throw rice anymore? I don't know. And we have this thing called the, the wedding ring or the wedding band that we can wear to signify. It tells all the ladies, hey, I'm off the market. I know none of y'all were worried about that anyway, but anyway. Uh, we, we have these things that signify outwardly the commitment that, that has been made through marriage and water baptism is the same. It's the outward it signifies to other people. Scripture says in Acts 2.41, again, right after many had been saved, it says those who accepted his message were baptized. And here's the reason why it's so significant. Matthew 10.32 and 33 says, whoever acknowledges me before men, this is Jesus speaking, He says, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven, but whoever disowns me before men, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Heavy stuff. So if you are not only immersed in Jesus, but you're not willing to let other people know, y'all, if people can't tell you're a Christian, and I want to be as kindly as I can put this, you might not be a follower of Jesus. You can say you're a Christian. You can say you go to church. That really isn't what matters. To be immersed in something means it covers you. It's just, it's just who you are now. And, and if, if you're not immersed in the Lord, if, you haven't, if it's not so public that other people can tell it, you might not be telling people enough with your actions, with, your, with the way you live your life. The third baptism, the one that we're going to focus on the most today, is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this is such a great gift that we were given from the Lord. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17 says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they had arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized... In the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You'll see a pattern of this all throughout the Old Testament. Way after the day of Pentecost, people were receiving the Holy Spirit because people would lay their hands on them. And can I tell you, I really believe the only reason people don't get baptized in the Holy Spirit is like that first scripture we read. They didn't even know there really was a Holy Spirit. They thought, well, I thought I got the Holy Spirit at salvation. Again, a lot of denominations teach that. Uh, They're not wrong. You do receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. And I wanted to just show a a, a quick, hopefully an easy to understand illustration about the difference of receiving what the Bible calls a measure of the Holy Spirit at salvation and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And right here, you can see all three in that scripture we just read, all three of the baptism talked about. 
said they prayed for the, those that believed, those that had, had been immersed into the body of Christ, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They were already saved, and they'd even been water baptized. So they'd been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They'd already been water baptized, but they hadn't yet got the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, when you are baptized into the body of Christ, if you will, immersed, it says that we have you know, God in us, Christ in us. The Holy Spirit is God. So we have the Lord in us, in our hearts, is what, you know, how the kids will say it. I've got Jesus in my heart. I've got God inside of me. That, that's awesome. Now, when you get baptized in water, again, it's an important thing. I don't want to downplay. If you have not been water baptized, you need to be. Jesus was. It's just like dunking this cup, though, in the water that's in this pitcher and then bringing it back out again. I mean, that, that you know, doesn't really do anything for the long term of this little cup. It's got God on the inside, but the water itself, you know, there's nothing magical about being baptized. It doesn't save you. It's just like wearing a wedding ring. It proclaims what's happened. It's, it's, an, it's an, an act that we do out of obedience. But to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, to be immersed in God. See, right here, you have God in you. The step that we want you to take about being baptized in the Holy Spirit is you being immersed in God. Does that make sense? To where everywhere you go, y'all, you don't have to wait till you come to church and hear the awesome praise and worship music to feel God's presence. God's presence is with you everywhere you go. You, you don't have to feel like, I, you know, I gotta have the preacher pray for me or I gotta wait till somebody more saved than me gets here to help this person. You got all that God has for you. You're immersed. Your very life is living for God and is following the leading of the Holy Spirit. You're completely immersed and you can't even really tell the difference anymore in where God is and the cup is. And, and, and it, that's what it really means to be baptized into the Holy Spirit. It, it's a lot simpler than, than we make it. Sometimes we think it's something, uh, you know, that, it, that it's not. And I, I want you to understand that these three baptisms, while each of them are significant, they're a little bit different. The first baptism, being baptized in the body of Jesus, uh, the body of Christ. It is completely free. There's nothing we do to deserve salvation. Amen. That baptism doesn't require anything on our part, but the next two do. And there's a reason for that. That first baptism, the baptism of salvation, the baptism into the body of Christ, that's for eternity. When you give your, your soul to the Lord, you give your heart to Jesus Christ, it is settled in heaven. The Bible says your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You've got the best reservation ever in glory someday. Can somebody say hallelujah to that? And y'all, that's taken care of. There's nothing you did to deserve it and there's nothing you have to do to deserve it. People think you've got to earn your salvation after you get saved. No, you don't. You just trust in Jesus. He paid it all when he died on the cross for you. So that's taken care of. These other two, though, they require something on our part. Water baptism, it's, it's a physical thing that you do. You, you are baptized by someone, and it proclaims, it, it represents that, hey, I want everybody to know that I'm saved. That's action on your part, because your life should tell other people, hey, I am saved, and I, I, I believe in the Lord Jesus, and, and you're a witness of him. And now, Holy Spirit baptism, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing. It's for here on earth. In fact, the Bible says there'll be a time when, you know, tongues and prophecies, those things will kind of pass away. We won't need them anymore because we'll be with God and, and, and th this mess of an, uh, of an earth will be repaired and, and all things will be made new. But right now, y'all, this world has a lot of darkness and it needs us to be a light in the darkness. We need power. We need help from the Holy Spirit to be able to do and be who God wants us to be. Can somebody say amen? We need God's help to make a difference in this world. 1 John 5, 7 and 8 says, There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father and the Word. The Word is Jesus. Uh, in the book of 1 John, he, it even starts off calling Jesus the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And So it says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. It also says there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Notice there's all three of the baptisms. 
the blood, being baptized by the blood of Jesus Christ into salvation. Water baptism, which is, uh, you know, what, what tells other people that, that we are followers of Jesus. It's that public proclamation. And then the Holy Spirit baptism. It says these three bear witness on earth. We need these to make it through this life and to make a difference with our life. So let's talk about being filled with the Spirit for just a, a moment before we pray and, and, and part ways today. Ephesians 5, 18 is a scripture I see used a lot uh, in the argument on should Christians consume alcohol or not. It, can I just tell you all this? It's always so kind of weird to me. I wish we worried more about what we were supposed to do than what we're not supposed to do. Yeah, it, it gets kind of frustrating. People are like, am I allowed to do this and still go to heaven? Well, let's not ask, can I do that and go to heaven? Let's ask, will that help me get anybody else to heaven? That's what I really wish we were asking. Like, what can I do to make a difference with my life? Not how much can I, you know, do with my life and get away with. And this scripture says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. So, you know, some people say, well, it just says don't be drunk. What? I don't even want to focus on that. It just says don't get drunk on wine. But it says instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, what I want you to understand about this scripture and take away from this is you have something inside of you because you're an eternal being. You're a spiritual being. You have a need to feel supernatural things and, and a need to, you, you know there's something greater you know, than yourself out there. And you, you feel you want to be a part of it. It's put there by God so that we will be drawn to him. And people try to fill that need with so many things. And you know what? A lot of people, they feel fear. They feel uh, uncomfortable. They feel pain. They feel guilt, whatever, that will lead them to, to maybe be drunk or maybe even do drugs or maybe even just get into a lot of relationships and sleep around because they're trying to feel something. They need to fill that void with something. And I, can I tell you, I think it's even why, and y'all know me, I'm a comic book nerd a little bit, but can I tell you, I think it's why millions upon millions of people pay money to watch. I, I can't get people to sit through a 30-minute sermon sometimes or they'll go watch a three-hour movie, which was a good movie, by the way, like Avengers Endgame. They'll watch that, and it's like, I heard people saying, man, I didn't even feel like three hours. You know, and they can quote me all the lines from the movie, but you ask them to quote some scripture, I just have difficulty understanding that. Hold on, you have difficulty understanding the word of God, but you got a made-up universe with a bunch of people with weird made-up names. You can quote all them, what powers they have, what planet they came from, what, all this stuff that they know, but you can't tell me nothing about the Lord. I'm not even preaching now, I'm just meddling, okay? But, but I want you to think about this stuff. Instead, and I'm not saying don't go watch Avengers, whatever. I, but you know what? If you're not doing anything with your life, for the Lord. Don't shoot the messenger. Like, I'm going to stand before God too, but you're not going to be able to stand before God and say that I didn't warn you. If you're not doing anything for the Lord, I don't want you to stand before God and be one of those people who God doesn't recognize. Who He says, many will stand before me and say, Lord, Lord, but he says, I didn't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. That's the Bible. So instead of wanting to fill that void, whether it's with drunkenness or, or just, you know, living crazy, you know, we're, we're thrill-seeking, you know, sometimes, or, or, or we just, whatever it is that we want that, that keeps us from really having a relationship with God, instead, we should want to be filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit. Here's how you do that. Four quick things. Number one, you've got to remove all barriers. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, it's like taking the lid off of a cup. The, the Spirit can't be somewhere that you won't allow him. He's a gentleman. Says the Spirit's subject to the prophet. That means us. He won't do anything that we won't allow him to do. Acts 2, 38 and 39 says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is why I say this, this didn't expire. I, I don't know why we got so divided denominationally on this. He says very clearly, the promise is for you 
and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. If you are called by the Lord unto salvation, you are called to make a difference with your life. You're not just called to come to church once or twice a month and hope that that's enough to go to heaven. You're called to be immersed in the body of Christ. Be immersed in the mission of the body of Christ. Immersed in the goals and the plans and the purposes that God has. And again, this warning is for somebody in here. I don't know who you are, but God wanted you to be here today to understand salvation is not just a prayer you prayed once or a decision you made once. It's a daily commitment to the Lord. And so you've got to remove any barriers if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Second, remove barriers, then request the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've got to ask for it. Again, God's not going to force it on you. But it says in Luke eleven thirteen, so well put, that if we then, though we are evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who? Who ask him? Sometimes people think, well, I've got to be, you know, a 10th degree black belt Christian before I can do the things that like a preacher can do or, uh, you know, those people at church. Do you ever see people at church and you just think that they never sin? You're just like, I want to be like that. They're like super Christian. And I used to wonder, how do you get to that? You know, what do you do? Y'all, all you got to do is ask God for the gift of the Holy Spirit, he'll give it to you. The same anointing that I have is completely available to you. Y'all do realize I'm nothing special. I love how, how we've been hearing it. We had a, a, a missionary couple come through and they just have a powerful ministry. And he put it this way, we're just like the donkey carrying Jesus to people. It's not about us, it's about who is in us. And so you got access to the same power. Do you know the Bible says the very power that raised Christ from the dead is in us who believe? I got to say that again because I don't, I don't think you understand. This ain't some little just hocus pocus make you have goosebumps on a Sunday because the singing was good or the preaching was good. Come on, somebody. But this says the very power that Jesus Christ had, that changed all of history, all eternity, that caused Jesus to be able to get up out of that grave, dwells in us if we believe in it. So it's not braggadocious, it's not boastful in us to say that all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth has been given to us because that's what Jesus died for. I don't want to take the freedoms that men and women died for that we have in America and take them for granted and not utilize them. So why do we do that with the gifts of God? We say, you really think Jesus died on the cross so we could just huddle together once or twice a week and hope we make it to heaven? No, he said, we came that we would stand against the gates of hell, the powers of darkness. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. He said, whatever the devil comes up with. Y'all, we live in a messed up fallen world. I get it. That's our job to fix it in the name of Jesus Christ. And he says, whatever the enemy comes up with, whatever weapon formed against us that he builds it will not prosper so why aren't we walking in that kind of authority it's because we got to ask for it you got to want it god wants you to have it you got to want to have it the next step you just receive him by faith and I, if you'll allow me to I, i'm going a little over but i want to walk through these last scriptures just for a moment ezekiel 47 this is a prophecy given by the prophet Ezekiel. It's some deep stuff. It actually goes on. Ezekiel's kind of a challenging book to, to, to read. And I think this, though, is such a powerful, perfect picture of our relationship with God and the presence of God in our lives. He says, As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. Now he was seeing like a vision. This is a prophecy that was given to him by God. He says he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. And if, if the music team could be getting ready, I, I want to just kind of 
relate the Holy Spirit to you through this scripture. When it says that, that a, a man had this measuring line, he measured off a thousand cubits, led me through water that was ankle deep and then knee deep and then waist deep, but then I get to a point where it's so deep I couldn't cross it. I, I, I had to swim in it, a river that no one could cross. This is relating to our journey, our, our relationship with God. There are different steps that we take in following Jesus. That's why we use that phrase so much. We are followers of Christ. And as you pursue Jesus, as you come closer to God, you should become more and more immersed in the power, the presence of the Lord. And we'll sing about it. There's that song, Oceans, uh, that I think is, is such a beautiful representation of, of even this scripture about he calls me into deeper waters. But I want you to understand, to receive the Holy Spirit, like we said, you're gonna have to at some point, I even want you maybe to circle that word, faith. You receive him by faith. There is going to come a point in your relationship with God where you're not gonna know exactly what the next step is, is gonna look like. You know you need to take it, but you're not sure what's gonna be there. It wouldn't be faith if you knew everything that was gonna happen, would it? It's faith when we get to that point where it's like, and now I'm in so deep, I can't really tell what all is to come. I can't tell what all is going to happen. Here at the beginning, there's where a lot of people are in their relationship with God. They're ankle deep. And really, that's all we need to be saved. We're baptized into the body of Christ. You are totally saved at that point. Somebody spirit-filled is not more saved than you. They're not more loved by God than you. You have access to all the same things they do. You're, you're just at that point in your journey. You're ankle deep in your relationship with God. But then it says, he measured further, and now I was knee deep. And some people get to that point where maybe it's where you're being baptized in water and you're starting to live a life that other people now, they can see that you're a follower, that you love God. That they, they see that about you, that you really do know God. And you're, maybe you're finding freedom from old stuff and they see, man, there's a transformation that's happened and, and you're, you're, you're changed, you're a new creation. And now, you know, you're, you're more... You know, covered by the things of God. Now, now maybe you're even going waist deep and you're, you're starting to discover your purpose and, and recognize, man, you can see you know, more of God's plan and, and, and you've been led deeper in the presence of God, but you're gonna get to a point where it's like, this seems a little overwhelming or a little daunting. I'm now to a point where I have to take a leap of faith. A lot of people don't receive the Holy Spirit because they're afraid of what it's gonna make them do. Uh, and, and I apologize for that. We in the Pentecostal world have not always done a good job of representing the Holy Spirit. And I've said this many, many times, and I want to say it again. God is not weird, and he will not make you weird. If you see some people that, that they're moved by the Holy Ghost and they act a little weird, can I tell you, they were probably just weird before they got the Holy Ghost. And that's okay. That's, don't, don't worry about how they're worshiping God any more than you should worry about what they think about how you want to worship God. If it's pure, if it's from your heart, you're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. Just worship him truthfully and don't worry about the rest. You don't have to look like anybody else, sound like anybody else. And y'all, it's so much deeper than just what happens in a church service or a response to a song. It's so much more than that. But that is that beginning point, that getting you know, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep. But there's a point where the, you get to the deep water, you're gonna have to take a leap, take a plunge, if you will. And it goes on, it's not in your notes, but if you read further in this chapter in Ezekiel, it says out there in the deep waters, that's where it was teeming with life. That's where life is really discovered and found. It's the same way. If you are in a place in your relationship with God, it just kind of feels dead. It's probably because you've not gotten to that point that you've completely given yourself over to the Lord. You see, when it's ankle deep, knee deep, waist high even, you're still in control. You can kind of walk around where you want to go. But when you get to this point, it describes it's a river I couldn't cross. I'm not gonna be able to get out of it. I'll be swept up. The river's gonna start taking me. It's gonna start leading me. You start to become led by the Lord. That's a different part of your relationship with God. Would you stand, if you're able, please, this morning? You're gonna get to a point where you have to receive him by faith. And this next scripture is so important, Hebrews eleven six. 6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him, notice there's two things. You must believe that he exists and that he rewards those 
who earnestly seek Him. Anyone who, if you're really coming to the Lord and you're really being baptized into salvation, that's two things. You not only have to believe He exists, but that's not all. The Bible says even the demons believe. The devil knows God's real, so that's really not all there is. You've also got to believe He rewards those who seek Him earnestly. That there's more to this if I pursue this relationship with God. Once I know him, he can help me find freedom in my life. Whatever step you're on, he can help me really discover what he created me for. He will help me have the power to make a difference with this life he gave me. That's an awesome thing if you think about it. And wherever you're at in your relationship with God, you can take that next step today. And then it's a daily journey. That's the final the final word I want to leave you with is that you want to relate to God daily. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Relate to Him every day. And this final scripture is really a, a prayer that I've, I even prayed over you today. And I've heard other ministers speak it as a prayer. And it's, it's so perfect that in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, The amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, I want all of you to experience all of God. I don't want you to think that there's a, a measure of God that only a preacher can get or only a prophet can get or only you know someone who's gone to church so often. Can I tell you, you can have as much of God as you want. All you gotta do is ask. If you would, bow your heads, bow your hearts. And today, you might be at the first step. You've never really been baptized. You've never really been immersed into the body of Christ. Because if you really, immersed means you've just given your all to it. And if you haven't done that, you need to do that first of all. Uh, if all you did was pray a prayer and, and your life didn't change, can I tell you, if your life doesn't change, you didn't really give your life to the Lord. I, I'm just warning you in that way. And if you're in here this morning, just quickly, quickly, I don't want you to overthink it, but if you say, I need to make that commitment today, would you raise your hand where you're at just real, real quick? Is there anybody? Okay, yes, yeah, several. Anybody else? Praise God. Because I don't know where you're at. It's, it's between you and the Lord. You can put your hands down. It's a personal thing, though. And so I, I don't even want you to wait. I'm going to pray over you in just a second. But will you talk to God? And the Bible says all you've got to do is repent. Admit that you've done wrong. And repent means you not only say I've done wrong, but you say I'm going to turn away from it. I want to do good now. I want to go the other direction with my life. Turn away from your old life and turn towards God. Be immersed. Be involved in the body of Christ. Be baptized into the work of the Lord. Get involved. And, and we've got next steps here for you to take. And as you talk to God yourself, privately, personally, I challenge you... Maybe even you've been baptized before, but you didn't really understand it. You didn't really mean it. Your next step really is to be water baptized. And I'd love for you to mark that on a connection card. Let us know or let me know, let Pastor Mark know, any of the ministry team, just so we can help walk alongside you in that next step. But I feel really, uh, God really impressed on me that there's a lot of people in here that you need to really be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, maybe you didn't really fully understand it, or maybe you've been baptized before, but can I tell you, it's not something you just do once. You're supposed to be immersed in it. It should be a daily thing. And you, you want the power of God. You want to feel God's presence. I, I would love to, to get to, to pray for you and pray with you. If you want to ask God, if you want to seek God, you receive it by faith, just like salvation. And I want to tell you just real quickly my story. When I gave my life to the Lord and got saved and then I desired the Holy Spirit, I wasn't even at a church service on a Sunday or anything. My granddaddy, he kind of has a similar story. He grew up here in Iowa Park. He was raised Church of Christ. They were who they believed water baptism saved you, and you had to be water baptized. They didn't believe in the Holy Spirit uh, moving the way that the Bible says. 
my granny started going to the Cass Street Church of God, and he just went. He said they had good singing and good food. That's what Pentecostals do. We sing good and we eat good. But he didn't really want the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But he struggled with alcoholism. In fact, my granny had almost had to leave him several times because he was very abusive when he would get drunk. And he was covering up so many hurts and so much pain. His story was like this. He, he was scared to go down and let people pray for him. He's like, I don't know what you're supposed to do. Some people are telling people to hang on. Other people are telling people to let go. I, didn't, I got confused. He said, I'm, I don't want to do that. So he worked on oil derricks right around here in you know, Wichita, Palapino County. He was up on, a, on, a, on an oil rig. And he said, I just decided I wanted God. I wanted to know God for real. And to, and to be immersed. I mean, that's not how he said it. He, he said it much more plainly. But he said, I was up on that oil derrick and I just said, Holy Spirit, if you're real, I want to know you and I want to feel your presence. And he said, while up on that rig, nobody else around that could see him or hear him, he said, I got hit by a bolt of, it just felt like electricity, like power hit me. He said, and it shook me because I started crying. He goes, I'm up on this old Derek crying. I've got to come down and see all these roughnecks and I'm bawling like a baby. My granddad got filled with the Holy Ghost up there. He said he started speaking in tongues up there on the oil rig. He said, just because I submitted my heart to God. Here's the thing, though. He didn't just feel a jolt and a bolt and it go away. He never drank again from that day on. He never hit my granny again from that day on. And y'all, my, my kids, his grandbabies, he's, he's gone on. He's buried over there in Highland. But y'all, he's in heaven. My family will never know the sting of alcoholism that my dad had to endure because my granddad got changed and him and my granny, they prayed over their offspring. They prayed over that that curse would be broken because you know what? Before him, they've been bootleggers for years, man. You might see some Robertsons. And if you do like Ancestry.com, you might find us, some of us you might not be too proud of. But can I tell you, that was all broken by the power of the Holy Spirit. And some of y'all need that power for you to be able to live who God's called you to be. You say, I've come from bad stock or bad family. Well, I don't care what you came from. I care from where you're going by the power of the Lord. And if you're in this place this morning, you want to be baptized in the Spirit. I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal over everybody because I don't want you to feel rushed and I don't want you to feel on the spot. But if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, I'd love to pray with you. Pastor Mark's going to come. Several will be here to pray with you. We'll lay hands on you just like it said they did in the New Testament. And all you do is receive it by faith. And I believe you will never be the same if, you, if you'll let God completely immerse you, baptize you into the Holy Spirit. Can we pray together? And after this prayer, they're going to sing us out. Y'all can be dismissed. But if you want the Holy Ghost, I want you to move quickly. You can even come while I'm praying. Get, just get down here. You say, I want you, God. I, I want this. And if you need a, a refilling, if you're dry, if you just, just feel like, man, I've just been going through the motions of church and, and I need the, the presence of God, the power of God, I challenge you to move quickly too. And your faith might help somebody else's faith. So as we pray, just begin to move. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gifts that you gave us, the baptism into salvation, into the body of Christ. I thank you, God, for the power of, of, of what it means when we get water baptized, what it represents. But, but God, I also thank you. You didn't leave us helpless or hopeless. You've given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that even those people that just gave their hearts to you this morning, that said they just want to be saved, I, Lord, I pray that all of us would want more of you to go deeper and deeper in our relationship with you, God. And I pray for hearts to be drawn to you, for people to want to be changed so that they can be world changers. And I pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ and all in agreement said, amen. Amen. Would you give God praise just for his gifts to us? And again, if you want prayer, I, I'll hang around as long as you need. If not, go with God. You're dismissed. God bless you for being here. Have a safe and happy Memorial Day. God bless you.